but uh, we can, I, I'm going to, uh, to give a welcome that I've learned uh, in serving at ministry at Curve Lake First Nation. So I would say uh, Anin Bojo, Dejnikaz Rodney, uh, Bob Cajun, Donjaba. And so my name's Rodney and I, uh, I, I'm from Bob Cajun. I live in Bob Cajun, but I serve at uh, the Buckhorn Pastoral Charge, Wesley and Curve Lake United Churches. And I'm the Minister for Indigenous Justice and Respectful Relationship within the East Central Ontario Regional Council. And um, people uh, from Toronto to Ottawa are here tonight and maybe beyond, and we're, and we're glad you are uh, inside and, and beyond the church. And so it's really exciting that we could uh, come together and consider uh, the fragile gift of Indigenous language and really grateful uh, to have DJ uh, presenting here tonight. Um, I, have, uh, I have known DJ for about 15 years when uh, he was a leader on a, a canoe trip that we organized and uh, I think DJ you were a teenager at that point and uh, you had very memorable teachings at that, maybe you're 20, I don't know, but uh, Someone who's known you much longer is going to formally introduce you, and that's your mom, Shelly. Uh, Shelly's part of our Indigenous Justice Relationship team as well, and has done, uh, yeah, work for, you know, many, many years within the church around faith and reconciliation. Um, before we do that, we have a co-host tonight, and that's uh, the Standing Together Against Racism group, and Aruna Alexander is from that group, and so Aruna, can you unmute yourself and uh, bring greetings. Okay, thank you. Um, thank you, Rodney. And uh, yes, as Rodney stated, I work with the Justice uh, Committee and within the Justice Committee, I lead the core group on uh, racism and intercultural interfaith issues. Um, happy to be here uh, this evening. Happy that uh, Sharon is with us as well. And thank you, Rodney, for all the work uh, that you did. Um, just want to say that uh, from a racism and intercultural perspective, this is a great event that is taking place this evening because, as we know and understand, language is a very important and integral part of our, our racism, um, or anti-racism, I should say, and, uh, and our cultural perspectives. And I would recommend to you our, our church's document, those of you who are with the United Church, Mending the World. And I think by looking at language in this way, um, uh, we are gathering together and standing together to mend uh, one of the broken pieces in our world. So, thank you. Okay, thank you, Aruna. And uh, Shelley, could you introduce us to DJ? Sure. Well, <laughs> up what you missed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I have the honor of not only being mom to DJ, but I have the honor of introducing you to my most favorite guy in the whole world. And, um, well, my dad comes in a pretty close second, but uh, DJ is definitely number one. DJ and I, um, I, I really love the relationship we, had, we have. And when DJ was about 10, um, it was just, I guess, going into grade six-ish. He came home just before summer break and he, and he said, Mom, I, I want to know what my Nishnaba name is. And... Uh, so I said, geez, so like, you know, that's, that was quite a while ago. And, and we've had a long journey in getting into our heritage since then. But then I said to DJ, I said, I don't, I don't know the first thing about that. My guy, let's, um, maybe you'll have to go offer your tobacco to Merritt and uh, see if you can find your name. So he stood in the pouring rain outside of Merritt's house with his tobacco in, the hand, in his hand. And Merritt says, you want to come in? He goes, no, no, I'm good. And he offered tobacco to Merritt, asking him if he'd find his name. And I said to Deej at that time, I said, I don't even know what this means, Deej. I don't know if it means you have to walk the red, the red path and, and the commitment involved with that. I don't know anything about that. But um, he said, well, I can tell you right now, I'm, I'm pretty committed to that. 
and I, he's always been this old soul. So around that time, I, I, I believed him. I believed that he was going to be committed. And um, so he, we had a naming ceremony for that, that fall. It was beautiful. And since then, I don't think Deidre's really looked back in trying to figure out who our people are through language. And he has been very committed to understanding how our people saw this land and through the language. And so he knows more than I do just uh, because he knows the language. He got to, um, my mom passed this February and, and he got to understand her way of thinking in the way I never was able to. It, it frustrates him because I don't speak it. I'm in that valley where uh, the system really made sure we didn't speak, my generation didn't speak. And uh, so he gets frustrated that I don't, but I'm like, we're all working hard to pick up the pieces in the ways that we can. So I've been, I've spent my whole life, uh, my whole professional career in Indigenous education, but hopefully um, Deej will help me uh, retrieve what, I, what I'm missing because there's a lot there and he's going to tell you about that tonight. So anyway, uh, I have the honor of being mom to DJ, who is a warden at Petroglyphs Park uh, by day in the season, the, the spring to fall seasons. And during this off season, he kind of does this stuff and he's actually teaching at uh, the secondary school for KPR right now. And he, he'd rather be wardening, but um, anyway, can't wait to hear what you have to say, my guy. Uh, yep. Sorry. Waiting for my cue there. Um, right, Mum, you watch. DJ, the job, and she will pass, and then I'll get a long dinner. She'll be on the cast. You know, you'll skew my own rules about the job, and she will not take you. DJ. Sorry. Yeah. We're going to have to go to the. Uh, oh, yeah. I think. Sorry. What's that, sorry? Uh, we're going to have to go to the presentation, I think. Okay. Mm. So the audio is on. Yeah, its no, I know. Uh, if we all turn off our cameras as well, it may help boost the sound for DJ, so. You know, you're going all together, DJ. <laughs> oh, did we lose them? All right. Uh, and it's also saying the screen sharing is disabled currently. Sharing? I think, yeah. I think uh, it might be that my internet's having an issue sharing the uh, audio and the video. But if I can do the screen share, uh, it might be good to go. So sh I think share make you co host. You should be, try it again, DJ, you should be able to. Oh, know. there we go. I got it now. Yep. Thank you. Here. There has to be a couple of hiccups before we get anywhere. <laughs> All righty. So, uh, well, fortunately, the majority of what folks uh, missed in the beginning, there's Nishnab Benwin anyway. I'll give you some some more later on. Um, I was thinking I uh, I was going to have some 
stuff already written out there on a Word document just to share with you some phrases and stuff, but I, uh, I think I'll just do it by hand uh, as I show it to you. Um, at any rate, uh, just the intro there is just introducing myself in Nishinaab um, and I'll just do it again in English here now. Um, but uh, my name is DJ Fife in uh, Jagnashiwan, which is English, and uh, I'm Mong in Nishinaab which is uh, Loon in the language. Um, I'm 29, I'll be 30 in April, um, but uh, I've been pursuing the language uh, for quite a long time, actually. Um, I actually went through all of school from kindergarten through to grade 12 uh, in Ojibwe class. I think I made, might have skipped grade 10. Um, but it really took off for me after school when I made it per uh, personal pursuit and I uh, made it a habit uh, or a real effort to visit my grandparents who spoke the language every week. Um, so I just made it part of my everyday life to um, just go in and find out as much as I could because I just wanted to solidify this uh, part of myself. Um, growing up, I uh, always was trying to figure out my identity because I am of mixed ancestry. Um, got some Scottish ancestry, and Anishinaabe ancestry, and there's some other stuff in there too. Potentially, we don't know for sure what uh, what other histories are there. But um, growing up in Curve Lake has always been a, a very prominent feature of my life um, in the community there. Uh, it was kind of interesting though because in my first four years of life, I uh, lived in Kitchener. And I knew that my granny and papa were, were Nishinaabe, um, but I didn't really put together that I was too. Um, and my granny was a, a Nishinaabe uh, language teacher uh, for most of her, her professional career. And my grandfather, my papa, Keith, um, was the chief in Curve Lake for a long time. Um, so they were very prominent figures in the uh, community that way. So I always knew they were Nishinaabe, but it never really clicked for me that I was too. So anyway, the the big thing that I kind of took hold of was uh, language. Um, so, uh, and if people are messaging, I can't see it. So we will have to, uh, someone with audio will have to let me know. But uh, the uh, the thing that I really hung on to was language. And uh, it's, you know, a reflection of everybody's history. Uh, what I tell our students there is even in English, there's language that's very specific to our um, personal story. Uh, like um, like my grandparents, we call uh, Papa and Granny, uh, but on my dad's side, they're Grandpa and Grandma. And then in uh, other families, they might go by Nana or Nanny or Pappy or Pa, whatever. And so that language is specific to your family and your story. And Nishinaabe one for me is, is like that. <laughs> they were, um, despite not really fully realizing, you know, for a while, like what it meant to be Nishinaabe, I guess. There were words that I grew up with that I didn't know were um, not English, and this is a great way to start the slideshow. I don't know why I did it this way, but I guess it's it's a kind of reflection of our culture that we're just kind of goofy. Um, but I actually didn't know the English word for uh, uh, fart <laughs> until I was nine years old, and uh, we went on a, a trip to the Toronto Zoo, and there was a hippo in the water, <laughs> and I uh, farted under the water there, and I ran around telling all the kids that I didn't even know, um, non-native kids, like, that hippo bogan. And my dad told me that. He said, they don't know what you're saying. And uh, that was when I realized um, that uh, I guess I knew another language to an extent. Like, it wasn't a lot, but um, it was always part of that. Uh, it's always the the kind of crude stuff, too, um, or the bothersome stuff. Skim egg uh, was synonymous for me. I knew the word mosquito as well. Uh, we called them skim egg, too. That's how you say mosquito in Nishinaabem one. Um, and uh, always, like I said, the crude ones like Mo <laughs> and uh, other ones like that. So um, that's another thing too I'll show you is there that's uh, a little example of how it's written um, by most people today. Uh, I'll get into a little example or explanation of that because it's um, a little different than maybe how we read things in uh, English writing typically. So, so DJ, just to interrupt, yep. we're just seeing a black black screen at the moment are you yeah. <laughs> well that's weird do you want to unshare and try again oh maybe oh i wonder sorry my video is not i guess maybe the video has to be yeah the video and my audio got muted at that one point when you guys lost me and i didn't start the video again because i didn't think i'd have to i think what the problem is there is that that video 
uh, has to be going for me to uh, also share the screen. So we'll try that now. Uh, okay, now what are you seeing? We're still seeing the, oh, there we go. We got it. Okay, There's a little your, delayed. Your Perfect. first page okay. is what we're seeing right now. <laughs> well, anyway, yeah, it's just a couple of uh, slides and they're the, I don't know, they're not the piece de resistance of the of the slideshow anyway. Oh, oh let's get back. Here we go. So just for example, this is a, a little bit. So also too, um, it, so this is about the story with the hippo, Bogodeo hippo, but I was just saying Bogod without that I on the end. Um, and skim egg um, for mosquitoes, the skim egg, if you're fully enunciating it, and mole. <laughs> but um, the, uh, the one thing you'll find uh, if you ever get to see a bit of Anishinaabe when, um, in today's community is that a lot of people know some words and things, but they don't necessarily use it correctly. Um, it's kind of like broken English, right? If somebody knows a little English, they might not use the grammar quite right and all that. Um, that was the case for me too at that age. So like we always say bogged, but that you should, if you're talking about somebody else, it should be bogged. Anyway, <laughs> um, so I, I started to realize like the significance of um, that language and my identity uh, because I've always been trying to pin it down, as I said. And uh, I remember seeing um, people on TV and seeing them being proud of their ancestry and their culture and, and reflecting that. Um, so the slide here, um, two Garaskagoli in Boston there. I don't think he was the one I was thinking of when I was younger, but I, you know, I just thought about how goalies like to reflect their personal, you know, identity and stuff with some of the artwork they have on their goalie helmets. So you can see Tuka's from uh, Finland here. He's got the Finnish flag and, and I, I don't play goalie, but and I never played in the NHL, but if I played in the NHL and I was a goalie, I would have wanted to have some way of like showing the little kids back home that I was, you know, proud of where I came from and, and uh, knew where I came from. And you know what, Canada's still that for me to an extent, but uh, I always wanted to think like if I could get to that kind of level, I would want to have a little uh, Nimke flag there. If you're not familiar, uh, Nimke is the thunderbird. Um, and it's not just one bird, it's a species of spiritual birds. Um, and there's a whole legend around that. And uh, it's said to be kind of the protector of the people. And it's come to symbolize the Anishinaabeg because it's such a prominent figure in so many stories. And it's seen in a lot of rock art sites across Ontario. And um, it's not just a figure solely in, in Anishinaabe or Ojibwe culture. Um, it's seen in other cultures as well. But it just has a very special place for us. That's what that symbol is. And it's used even today for uh, um, political affiliations like Anishinaabeg Nation. So, <clears throat> but uh, I am uh, very uh, homestuck. So uh, if you're not familiar with Curve Lake, uh, this is a little satellite view of it. Uh, so this is just about a half hour drive north of Peterborough, which is straight south of us there. Um, and it's just that peninsula, uh, right about that second bend. Um, well, actually, we've actually had some additional land there, but right around that 22 there on the road. Um, but Nishina Benwin in uh, our dialect in particular, uh, the Mississauga dialect, uh, used to be comprised of uh, five communities, Curve Lake, Alderville, uh, Hiawatha, Scugog, and uh, New Credit. And um, there's a whole history there too. And if we have time later, maybe I'll get into that a little bit. Um, today, that, that uh, language only really exists in this community, um, that specific dialect, I should say. And uh, it's, it's all older folks. Uh, and that number is quite small, the number of speakers. So that uh, language, this is where it lives. And this is where I grew up. And this is my home. So it's a uh, it's all kind of intertwined for me there. <clears throat> and uh, more specifically or more finely, um, it's a connection to my family in particular. And uh, this is uh, looking at my grandparents' house. So just off to the right of the screen, the bottom right is my Aunt Jill's house. And then behind that's my other Aunt Mindy's house. And then behind that is my mom's house where I live. And uh, this path here uh, would have been started by my papa about 60 years ago. Um, when they first moved in there and he worked just at the public works just back behind here and he started walking to work every day and uh, started this little path that's been worn into the ground and um, we uh, have since continued walking that path that's uh, the way we all make our way over to Granny and Papa's to connect and to me I, I, uh, I guess this was right around when I started putting together presentations I was just kind of 
I wasn't even looking for inspiration, but it just kind of came to me here. And I was just uh, looking at Granny Papa's and just thinking about how uh, just it's it's the right place. It's home. So where I felt safe and nothing was wrong generally. Um, and I've walked that path and we've all, every member of my family has walked that path at some time. And so the point of this particular image is that that path is a physical manifestation of the connection in our family. And uh, an extension of that for me is that Anishinaabe when that Anishinaabe language is an extension of that uh, connection. It's a, so rather than a physical, as in dirt packed in the ground there manifestation, it's an audible or verbal uh, manifestation of that connection. So, and uh, another key part of the language for me is um, that I am enthralled with the land, uh, kind of reflected in my line of work as a park warden. Um, I like being outside, I like being on the land. Um, the land here in Ontario is uh, really special to me. I like to get out there and, and uh, I just walk around and I think about the language. And um, I didn't um, make this connection where I had originally taken this picture or, or when I had uh, started using this picture in presentations, but this is in Killarney Provincial Park. Um, out between Perry Sound and uh, um, up by Sudbury. <clears throat> so just out across the lake there is actually Manitoulin. And when you're there on that hill, Silver Peak, it's the highest point in the park there. Uh, you can just make out the edge of Manitoulin over there. And then you turn to the right, you can see the smokestack in Sudbury, about 70 kilometers away. It's a very beautiful spot. And uh, anyway, since the, the time that I'd gone out there, this was about six years ago, I went there. Um, I read this story in Nishinaabe in Ojibwe about these boys who, um, and also, sorry, the story was recorded about a hundred years ago in um, Manitoulin and then written down and all that. And uh, anyway, the story was about the Thunderbirds and these two boys who paddled across um, to where the mountains were. And I had always heard the stories about how the Nimki, the Thunderers, uh, lived in the mountains. and. I was always thinking, I don't know where these mountains are supposed to be in Ontario, because I mean, we've got, like, I've been to the Blue Mountains and stuff like that, but they're not, like, that high, but if you ever go to Killarney, you'll see that these are our mountains, the Lacloche um, Mountains. And uh, <clears throat> anyway, uh, supposedly uh, the Thunderers lived up in the top of these mountains, and those boys went up there and got into some trouble with them and all that, but uh, it really kind of uh, came full circle for me that you know I wouldn't have had that appreciation for that story if I hadn't really learned the language and, and thought about it that way and had that connection that you know this history goes back um, but it's a reflection how the, the language National Bandwagon in particular is tied to this land specifically um, so this is uh, just closer to my home here this is what I was doing a lot I haven't much this last year but uh, I still like to just get out on the land and just walk and I'm all over the place and I almost think about the language um, and uh, it's often these kinds of places um, where <clears throat> I think about things that I want to find out how to translate. I want to think about how my ancestors would have talked about this um, because I was inspired to, I've always been inspired by the way that Anishinaabeg traditionally would have lived on the land, like their office was the land, like that's where they were every day and, and just learning the geography of things and knowing where things go and all that. Um, I get to places and I wonder, um, I wonder when the last time someone spoke Ojibwe was here. Um, something I <clears throat> just told my students, uh, I just started teaching at the secondary school uh, the other day actually, but something I was telling them was about <clears throat> uh, how, I know some folks talk about where Indigenous people came from um, and all that, uh, like they talk about coming across the Bering Strait and, and other places and everything else. And, Whatever the case may be, I wasn't there however long ago it was that Anishinaabe came to be here. Um, regardless, the Anishinaabe language originated here. It came from this land, um, in like North America anyway. So that's why I, I really attach to that history because it is tied to this land for me. And uh, this is another shot here where I climbed a tree and I was looking at the ice and just, it's just a reflection of seeing these beautiful scenes and, and that is the connection for me with that language is that it ties me to that beauty so, shot there and it's uh, reflected in some of the words we have as well for things in the land obviously this is uh, a wabuz if you can make it out it's a rabbit and it's uh, got its white uh, winter coat that word uh, wabuz the initial portion of that that wab w-a-b if we were to spell it out um, is a reflection of the color light of white or light and that might have to do with the white color it has during the winter, obviously. Uh, additionally, 
We have lots of wild skashwag. This is actually at the park at Country Lakes where I work. We got a ton of deer. Um, <clears throat> that Wawash Gash, um, the word is very descriptive. It, it actually talks about uh, the flash of its tail, I believe. I d I've never seen that Shkesh anywhere else, um, the last part of its name. But the Wawa is also found in um, the word for mouse, uh, which is Wawa Gnolji. And I had a, a kind of cool special uh, interpretation with my granny there the one time, and it really clicked for me. Uh, I don't even know why it came up, but um, she was saying that uh, it. The name Wawa Gnolji, the, the mouse, is the, the scurry or the flashing little hole maker. The Wawa, just like Wawa Shkasha for a deer, um, is around the kind of flash. The, in terms of the deer, would be the flash when its tail goes up and it takes off. Um, and the mouse would just be how you just catch a glimpse of them. But the Wawa Bagonji, the Bagon there, is around holes. So, and G ending is just a small little animal, typically, if you ever hear that ending. So, it, it's cool. To, to learn the language because it's um like i said reflective of the, the land and, and there's a uh, very descriptive elements of it um i don't really have a special description of uh, the word here too but uh, we have words obviously for the trees as well jingwok that's my favorite tree white pine um, and uh, there's other names for them as well too jingwok is generally the white pine but there are specific names too that can be um, added onto that so yeah that's kind of what i'm always thinking about when i'm out there on the land <clears throat> so beyond that too, uh, looking at the bigger picture uh, in terms of uh, reflection in our history today, I just kind of highlighted areas that um, made me think of it. And you can see Killarney up there in the top left, but uh, there are a ton of place names. These are just ones that just quickly went over. But there's, if you were to zoom in and, and able to mark them all up, there's a ton of place names that are taken from um, Nishinaab and Wunero Ojibwe specifically, and uh, otherwise from our cousin languages in the Algonquian language family. So um, <clears throat> Curve Lake, uh, if you haven't been there, um, it's just above Peterborough there. I kind of highlighted uh, Shamong Lake. Um, that unfortunately, a lot of words when they get borrowed into English often end up getting corrupted. And so they're missing some parts that uh, it's just, you can't quite figure it out. Shamong, there's a lot of speculation around what it actually is, but uh, I'm not able to say 100% what it would be. Um, even otherwise, uh, to the left of it, there's Pigeon Lake, which was named after John Pigeon who uh, was from Curve Lake and hunted over there at the time that settlers were naming places. And at the bottom end of it is the town of Omimi where, um, oh, uh, you know, what's his name? I'm gonna forget his name. <laughs> anyway, anyway, uh, don't even put it in the chat because I, I don't know why I'm blanking on it right now. I can picture his face. Omimi means pigeon in Ojibwe. And uh, that's kind of cool to have that whole tie there for us. Uh, aside from that, the general region where we live here is known as the Kawartha Lakes. And that name is, specifically tied um, and more recently from Curve Lake uh, about a hundred years ago or so. Uh, and as I understand the story, um, there was a steamboat company either in Peterborough or Bob Cajun, uh, Bob Cajun also being an by name, and they wanted a um, name for the region that was, uh, you know, kind of exotic, I guess, kind of like Muskoka to draw in tourists because come to Peterborough County doesn't quite have the same draw as, uh, you know, a traditional native name. So they said, if someone can, can come up with a name, we'll give you a prize. And uh, this old demo, yeah, this old lady came up with uh, Gowate Wagame or Gowate Wagma. Uh, Wagame just being water, um, Wagma being lakes specifically. Um, Gowate Wagama is uh, lakes where it, or like reflecting light off the lake, essentially. And they said, okay, we'll run with that. We'll say it means land of happy shining waters. I don't know, maybe the, the lady kind of described it that way, perhaps, but um, they, the trouble is they took off the Agama or Agamet ending, which is the water element. And uh, with that, they've got Kawate, which um, does have to do with light, but sometimes it can kind of, it depends on the ending, what it will end up being, but it can have to do with um, shadows actually being cast too. So anyway, they did that. So you could interpret it as a land of like shadows or something, but they put an RTH in there, the Kawartha, the Artha part. And uh, there are no R's or THs in our language. Um, so it's kind of just really corrupted. They, the name Hiawatha, the reserve down there, is actually an Iroquoian word. And that language is completely separate from us. It would be like comparing, uh, like, I don't know, uh, an African language to um, like Latin or something, right? They're just completely different. Um, aside from that, uh, obviously, there's um, a number of place names in Toronto that are specifically from our language family. Uh, one in particular, uh, well, actually, before I get to it, 
just wanted to point out another one that's kind of interesting, uh, just because I keep thinking about it, is uh, how the pronunciations get messed up a little bit. So the town way up north of uh, Wawa should probably be pronounced Wawa, actually. And likewise, uh, Padawawa, the Canadian Forces base there, would be Bidwewe, and it's talking about the sound of the, the fall, or the falls in the river there. So the, if you spell it, or if you look at it the way it's spelled, when it was originally spelled, that's probably how people might have said it, but an English speaker reading that wouldn't say it that way. Bidwewe. PE should be maybe two E's, PE, anyway. But Oshawa is what I was thinking of. And uh, well, my aunt went to school at Durham College, and I remember her saying that uh, uh, people were trying to, like her new roommates or somebody were trying to figure out like what her ancestry was. And uh, they said like, what are you? And she said, oh, I'm an Ojibwe or whatever. And I, uh, thinking back on that story, I was quite young when she went there. Um, I thought it was kind of ironic because Oshawa is taken from our language um, and it likely means Ajoyin. There might be some other interpretations. I, like I always wondered if it actually had to do with Zhaonong, which is in the south, but Ajoyin makes a bit more sense to me. And so that's just on the other side of the thing, I think. And uh, I don't know if the, the name got applied there when they were actually talking about the other side of Lake Ontario or something, because you can sometimes just see a bit of the edge of the other side of the lake, sometimes way up high there. I don't know. It's just interesting to, to see that history and. Um, that's uh, stuff that once I started getting into the language, it really started uh, sticking out for me. I was like, geez, there's, there's, um, there's all these place names all over the place that uh, are from our language. Just trying to think of the other cool ones. There's a lot of really good ones out there, uh, close to Halliburton and stuff. Um, it's uh, interesting to think about once you get to it. Um, I haven't talked about our uh, language family here, but that's the Algonquian language family. You can see it's spelt at the top there. This is just from Wikipedia. You can look it up yourself. Um, so the same way that, uh, well, I'll show you a diagram later, but the same way that, say, Spanish, Italian, and French are all related, they're all Latin-based, they were all originally the same language, and they spread out over time into different families. Um, there are a number of uh, families that are related. You can see them listed there, uh, I think. Actually, maybe you can't. Um, but <clears throat> they were all, once upon a time, the same people, and over time and distance, they spread into their own um, specific dialects, which became their own languages. and. Uh, at any rate, uh, it's a very large language family, as I'll show you later. Um, to carry on with the, the place name um, trend I was talking about, there are three provinces in Canada um, which are from this family. The uh, names of Quebec, you would think is French, it's actually um, our kind of related language, Algonquin, it's pretty much Ojibwe. Uh, we would say Gabak for some, like that's the start of something that closes. Gabak Sidon would be, how you'd say, shut that, like shut a door. Um, and talking about the St. Lawrence River and how it closes. And Manitoba, which Manitou is a spirit. Uh, I don't remember the ending of it. It's been shortened down, but it has to do with uh, the Strait of the Spirit, I believe, on Manitoba Lake or Lake Winnipeg. Uh, again, another Anishinaabe word. And then uh, Saskatchewan. And uh, that one has to do with the river. I don't remember the initial part of it, but the Chowan part, if you hear at the end of it, same with Kasheshawan, First Nation, and any other Chowan. Uh, in, Her in Peterborough, we've got the name of Ngojwanong, that Jiwanong is the, the river part of it. So anyway, it's cool um, with place names. There's six states as well. I won't get into those. Anyway, another thing is there are borrowed words in English that are taken from Anishinaabe uh, and our cousins. So chipmunk uh, isn't how we say chipmunk, actually. It's how we say jidmo, uh, which is how we say squirrel. Um, so when Europeans came over, they saw this creature and they are like, what do you call that? And they go, oh, I don't know, it's jidmo, it's just a squirrel. And uh, that name kind of got changed a little bit, but it stuck. Um, you can see some of the other words that are borrowed uh, from our cousin languages. Um, this list goes down a little farther too. Um, I always think about uh, the hockey announcer, holy Mackinac. Um, that's from McKinnock, uh, which is how we say a turtle, a snapping turtle. Uh, I didn't highlight it here, but moccasin, um, that's how we say shoe, McKizzen. And uh, I didn't highlight moose either. Originally, uh, the Europeans who first came over, uh, and you know, they have like what they call elk over there, which are related. But the guys who came to um, North America initially wouldn't have seen those moves before. And uh, the Abenaki, as they say here, I had thought it was a Mi'kmaq. Um, they say moles in Anishinaabe when we say moles, um, pretty much the exact same word, moose, moles, and tree might say mosa, I believe. Uh, and then muskalunge is um, borrowed, yeah, see, it says ultimately here, it's borrowed twice. So we say majgenoja, a genoja is a, is a pike, and the name is, again, descriptive. Gnoja is just a, a long skin, essentially. 
if you know what a pike looks like. Uh, the fish that is, if you're not uh, thinking about what I'm thinking about. And Majgonoja is a, a kind of ugly pike or the bad pike because, uh, you know, the pike's bright silver and clean looking and the Majgonoja is a, a bit muddier kind of um, camouflage color. Uh, and then beneath that too, you can see muskeg there. We say muskeg for uh, a swamp. Oh, um, one I didn't highlight because I didn't really look into it at the time or didn't think about it. At the bottom there, opossum uh from powhatan and that would have been like pocahontas people just for reference as far as how far our language family goes um that is actually very similar to how we would say like a white dog as you can see is said here so we would say awabanim they've just changed a couple of sounds so they'd say opossum opossum awabanim uh, and just for comparison so the basis of dog for us is nim uh it's become nimosh over time which actually kind of means darn dog uh, but for the Cree, they say a Tim, and for the Powhatan, apparently they would have said a Sim. So they would say a Sim, we'd say a Nim, and the Cree would say a Tim. Um, the Stot Tim is a big, big dog, a horse for the Cree. Uh, and Skunk was a good one too. Uh, so they got that from Massachusetts. Um, and uh, I have a dictionary that was originally transcribed by a missionary back in uh, 1840, I believe. And uh, I found the entry on the Ojibwe to English portion. And I found Jagog and I was like, oh, okay, so a skunk. And I was expecting to read in the English skunk. And he said some kind of wild polecat because they didn't have a name for it at the time. Um, so they said in Massachusetts, more like skunk. Uh, we say Jagog in uh, Nishinaabe and Winter Ocean Way. It's a little different, but you can see the similarity. Chicago, skunk, uh, toboggan, totem, and dodam is uh, my clan. Um, and there's a number of these other words too. And this one, uh, second from the bottom there, I know a lot of people talk about different ideas as far as what the Otonabi River means. I've heard a bunch of different um, interpretations of that, but I've always wondered about this too. I, I've only seen this in dictionaries from Minnesota, Atolabi. Uh, it might be Odonabi, and that would almost make sense, but I don't know. So, and then uh, uh, if you're here at Wigwam, it, it should be pronounced Wigwam. That's, that's how we say a house. It's uh, reflective of the uh, construction. So a uh, birch bark. Uh, well, a piece of birch bark is wigwas. So the name of the building that's made out of wigwas is a wigwam. And uh, wabadi, which they say here they got from the Shawnee, um, we would just say wabdi, it just means a white butt. Um, that's what a, an elk looks like, has that little white uh, bottom on them. So, yeah. It's just really cool to see that connection. And uh, this is a reflection of that uh, greater connection to my uh, Anishinaabe relatives and cousins and, and uh, fellow. We Anishinaabe across Anishinaabe King. So these little red dots uh, reflect places where Anishinaabe one of its various dialects is spoken or has been at least. I think this map would have been about maybe 25, 30 years old now. Um, but if you were to overlay this uh, in Europe, for example, it would be a very large country. And uh, all this history is kind of under the surface when you're just looking at a modern political map and you just see Canada there with you know what is just a few provinces um, but it's a very large area and all this history is there and uh, having that language allows me to really have a tangible connection to those people um, there's a lot of changes uh, so I'll show you that a little bit about dialects at the end there um, but the uh, you know comparison would be if you like if you took somebody from down here close to Toronto and you went way up north um, to the Manitoba border. Um, they speak Oja Cree up there. It's really Anishinaabe, it's Ojibwe more than it is Cree, I think. But there are some very big differences that might make it a little difficult to understand. Um, my my uh, granny said that the Anishinaabe one there was a little hard to understand, but uh, it would be like taking somebody from Paris, France and bring them down to Cajun, Louisiana, and they'd be like, I, we can't understand this swamp version of French, you know, it's just changed so much over time and distance. Um, so, and uh, even Quebec to modern uh, French too in, in France, so. But uh, real quick little view there of the Algonquian language family. Um, so, like I said, all these people once upon a time would have been uh, the same people uh, way back when. They don't know what that language actually looked like for sure, but they can kind of guess. And it's just because there's similar features. Like I said, it's like comparing uh, French and Italian and Spanish. If you heard Italian and Spanish at a distance, you might think they're almost the same language. There's some distinct differences, obviously, and the same is true with these languages, but um, it's just a natural phenomenon with language over time. It slowly changes and slowly becomes something else. Even generation to generation, you think of English, 
uh, what what are the kids saying these days? I don't know. They you know they've got their own slang, and, and that's how language evolves. That's just uh, the way it goes. But uh, yeah, you can see. Um, so they don't have Nishinaabe written here. They have Ojibwe, and all the other um, subgroups of it: Odawa, Nipissing, Algonquin, uh, Ojibwe, Soto. I should also point out there. Um, so you can see it says Algonquin. So that is a dialect of Ojibwe, pretty much. They consider themselves a separate language um, sometimes, but it's essentially a dialect of Nishinaabe. Um, but anyway, it's a little confusing because there's that dialect underneath this Algonquian umbrella. So if you're ever getting confused by that, it, I don't know, I, I just kind of chalk it up to trying to take an unwritten history and bring it into this written history or written uh, kind of organization, I guess. It doesn't always work out perfectly. Um, and then also just want to point out that the Potawatomi, um, the Budwayadamig, the people who make the fires. Um, my mom can tell you about how when they were kids, they, they used to tell my papa, Budwan, Budwan, make the fire. Um, they, I would say the comparison for Budwayadamig and Anishinaabeg would probably be like Portuguese to Spanish. They're really close. Um, they just have really shortened things down. They have a few different items and stuff, but at any rate. This is a, a map reflecting where that language family is found. So as I said, uh, the Powhatan people, the Powhatan Confederates and all those guys, um, like a Pocahontas fame, uh, would be down towards like Maryland area, Delaware and all that, I believe, if I remember correctly. Uh, anyway, they were on the Eastern Seaboard, as you can see here. And the words you see written are uh, the various languages way of saying woman. Um, so there's a bit of variation there. You can kind of see uh, just down towards uh, like New York. Um, their words are very similar to ours, which is Ikwe. Uh, so there's just a few different dialects here for Nishinaabe. When you say Ikwe, Ikwe with the I, and Ikwe in most of Cree. And that's uh, actually where the term squaw comes from. Um, so it, it literally just means woman, but it got kind of turned into a derogatory term. Um, that I, uh, actually is a, one example of where I like to joke that to make a Cree word out of a Nishinaabe word, you just put an S in it. So like we say Ikwe they say squail. Uh, likewise, we say makwa for bear, they say muskwa. Uh, we say a beaver is a mick, they say a misk. Uh, most dialects, that is. Cree's uh, got its own variants as well. Um, so yeah, this is actually just on Wikipedia too, if you look for it. Um, the Algonquian language family, I'm pretty sure this map is out there somewhere. Um, but uh, when you think about the, the distance involved here, how much uh, land is covered by this language family and all the history there, again, under the surface of the modern political uh, map. It's, uh, you know, it's quite the, the story and uh, nobody knows about it. And all these people spread this language and history and similar culture out um, over time and distance, walking and paddling canoes. And that just really speaks to me. And again, speaks to the land itself too. Um, there's this great website <clears throat> uh, called the Algonquian Linguistic Atlas. And actually a friend of mine, Marianne Corvier um, from Wikwemakong, she works at Sudbury. Uh, she has a big uh, hand with this, and uh, she does a lot of great work for the language up there at Lanchin College or uh, University. And uh, <clears throat> anyway, you can hear recordings of uh, people in various Algonquian communities um, with how they would say various things. There's a little drop down uh, list. Um, and a lot of the stuff uh, you can find similarities uh, between them if you know the language well enough. They're not always written the same way because the different languages use different systems. It would be really interesting to see. A consistent system used and see how it um, end up appearing but at any rate this one community way out there where the white box drops onto um, in Natu Ashish which is I believe in Quebec but it's right near the Labrador border uh, right on the uh, um, coast there off uh, Labrador and uh, most of the stuff they were saying I could kind of see like well I, yeah I can tell it's Algonquian like it's it's uh, related to our language uh, but this one sentence really stuck out to me here um, so you can see in the green just above the name Thomas Poker, it says, is he back yet? And uh, that's what uh, the part where the little speaker button is. I wish I could show you my mouse. Oh, maybe it'll show, I don't know. If you can see my mouse, great. Yeah. Um, right there, it says, uh, Shasha de Goshenu. And I have it again at the bottom of the screen. And uh, when I heard it, I was like, well, that isn't really too different from how we would say Ajana de Goshen, um, which isn't, is he back yet, but did he already arrive? Um, so we would say Aja, where they'd say Shash, and we'd say Na, which is the yes-no marker, and they say Ah, and we say Degoshin, and they say Degoshino. And uh, likewise, when we pluralize Degoshin, like we're saying they're arriving, um, or yeah, when they're arriving, it'd be Degoshinog, 
Uh, so we use that same ending that will, and uh, it kind of clicked for me like, wow, <clears throat> um, like that's a word I've heard my granny use and that she grew up knowing and was passed down to her from her parents and their parents and parents, and so on and so forth, um, thousands of years. And these people uh, that are saying the same thing I'm hearing in this recording are 1,700 kilometers away. And the last time we would have had a common ancestor would have been thousands of years ago, but that language has uh, carried through similar enough that I can still pick that out and, and uh, realize like, wow, like, that's the same language. And, and if I didn't have that knowledge of the language, like this wouldn't have meant anything to me. I wouldn't have been able to make that connection. Um, it wouldn't have clicked. Um, and uh, it actually reminds me of a story as well of uh, some young lads uh, from uh, Kishishwan, I think it was, or Ottawa, up on Hudson's Bay or James Bay anyway. Um, they were in the uh, army actually, and they came down um, with a, a youth group as uh, kind of stewards um, to the petroglyphs. And uh, they spoke Cree when they were kids. And well, actually they spoke Cree even then, even at their age, whatever, 25 or 22 or whatever. Uh, so I was bugging them uh, about languages, but I don't know, six years ago, seven years ago. And I was asking them all kinds of stuff. And they're like, oh, well, yeah, well, we say, you know, this way, it's pretty close. And eventually they're like, so we were like related somewhere way back there, huh? And I was like, you have no idea, man. And uh, it's funny because even if you grew up with the language, you might not get to appreciate it unless you take a little academic look at it and uh, think about it in this light of our uh, connections. This is um, some of the power of the language for me. Um, but uh, <clears throat> I don't know if I've got the right map for it. Can be, you can see here. But this uh, kind of speaks to some of the the uh, push for me as well from more of a negative end. And that is uh, looking at this uh, languages of Canada, which lists uh, and describes all the languages spoken in Canada. Uh, this works with the 2011 census. So I don't know if we've got any better information today, but uh, at that time, uh, you know, of like what, 36 million people in Canada, only 200,000 people spoke an indigenous language. Um, so that is a language that, you know, came from this land. Um, and uh, just for reference, it listed all the way down. So <clears throat> uh, these are all the most spoken languages. So you can even see here, there's just about as many Portuguese speakers in Canada as there are of all indigenous languages combined. Um, that being said, there are, you know, a lot of young Cree uh, kids growing up with, with a bit of language, but it's still not uh, in great shape. Um, and uh, just to show you the, the number down here, Cree, which is the most spoken indigenous language, has 77,000, almost 78,000 speakers. But there are 25 more, uh, 25 languages with more speakers than it, uh, than the, the highest spoken uh, indigenous language. Um, and uh, just for example, too, like I was, I had never heard of Gujarati um, at that time, but Gujarat is a region in India, and they have ninety thousand speakers in Canada. Um, <laughs> I was like, that's interesting because I had not even heard of it. Uh, Nishnabemun, uh, Ojibwe, uh, there are forty-four languages, including three, and Anuktitut, uh, which is at the very top there, and that's the Inuit language, um, that have more speakers. Um, I believe, uh, yeah, Hebrew is there, uh, and. So, you know, it's it's cool that we have the diversity and uh, have um, all this, you know, ability to share knowledge in various forms because language uh, carries nuances and history and stuff, just like I'm showing you here. But the thing is, you know, if um, we ran out of Finnish speakers there, the 17,000 of them in Canada at, at the time, uh, like if the kids didn't grow up learning Finnish anymore here, there's still the whole country of Finland where that language and that culture still exists and you can still get it. This, uh, between here and the, the couple of US states where Anishinaabe was spoken, it's just here where you find a language. And uh, once that language goes out, you're not finding it elsewhere, really. And uh, there are some indigenous languages uh, between Canada and the states where they're we're trying to revitalize it. But it's, uh, it's really something to think about when there's this pillar of history that's been going on as long as those people have existed. And uh, you're present to see the extinguishment of it, perhaps. Um, I don't know that like in my lifetime, I'll see all of Nishnabemun kind of go away uh, if in worst case, but uh, if this part of the province, uh, this would be one of the most dire places. I mentioned all those other communities of the Mississauga dialect. And uh, like I said, it's just Curve Lake where that exists and we're the northernmost of those communities. So it's literally just a, a matter of geography really and uh, assimilation. 
Uh, and there's other indigenous languages further down too. Ojikri, there's uh, 9,000 of them as well. So that kind of boosts the numbers a bit. They're all really isolated communities. That's why the language has really been able to hold out there. Uh, and Innu is um, that language that I said had the example with um, <clears throat> Shasha Degoshi. And there's Mi'kmaq, there are cousins of Pigmeg, which uh, they're they're pretty close to. They're 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 not Cree, but they're very close to Cree. Um, they're in Quebec, and uh, just for interest's sake, a Pigmeg for us is a, a whitefish actually in Nishnaga, and that's what their name probably means too. <laughs> so yeah, but this is just a reflection of that pillar of history. So. Um, you know, like if this is uh, representative of speakers of the language and carries of that knowledge and that culture, those blue dots would be like the Anishinaabeg. And as long as, and, and our, you know, ancestors and cousins, and as long as Anishinaabeg have been a people, that language has been spoken. And it's just here within, especially the last hundred years, but, you know, the last few hundred years that we're seeing, you know, the loss of that knowledge and that history and that language. And I'm right in the mix of those yellow and blue, but especially more so to the right there um, where I am you know in that position to be a connection between this pillar of history and this uh, continued story uh, and the potential future or I will be in that generation to see it end and it's just uh, it's really powerful and it's always really struck me I guess this has uh, been a big part of my uh, quest for my identity is is where where do I go what do I do here what do I do with this this challenge. So that's uh, some of the the interesting elements of it, and some of the uh, delicate elements of it. I guess uh, the um, the challenges, you know, aren't just uh, like outright assimilative uh, efforts. You know that we're all familiar with with residential schools and um, other efforts that way. Uh, there's also passive stuff too, like just thinking about in my community too, right? The kids growing up and myself, uh, we had lots of non-native friends and, you know, all of our friends speak English. So like, what are we going to just talk Nishnabeh at them until they, you know, speak Nishnabeh in an ideal world, but um, it's just trying to fit into this modern world, which is just completely overwhelming, right? It's a bit of the modern age. So there's, uh, there's a lot of challenges, but there's also a lot of efforts being made to preserve the language too. So it's not all negative. Um, but just for uh, a bit of familiarity with you guys, I'm going to make sure I didn't miss anything, but this is what the uh, key part of this uh, writing system that is most widely used in Anishinaabemwin is. So it's always the same sounds. In English, the writing we use is uh, kind of terrible if you uh, have never taken the time to look at it. Uh, but someone trying to learn to read English must have such an awful time. You think of um, the GH and things like uh, tough, enough, so those have an F sound. Uh, but like though is a there's no f sound it's not off or whatever um, or in the word uh, garage the g has two different sounds so there's garage it's not garag or garage uh, and the the a's I think too have two different sounds too so g and so uh and ah uh, uh, uh whereas in this system um, the single a is a u sound is in like but like uh the long uh, two A's is a longer sound of that, so ah, uh, so a uh, as in but, and ah uh, as in father. E is an eh or eh sound like Anishinaabe. Uh, I think it's somewhere between like bet and bag. It's it's it can vary a little bit with communities, but it's generally that kind of sound. And eh is always the sound made with the I. And that's something to keep in mind because some people, when they see it at the end, they think of the word ski in English. And they think it's a long e sound, but it's always eh. Uh, two eyes is the long sound. So eh, e, eh, e, o, o, pretty straightforward. Uh, although some people might see two o's together and think of like a uh, tune, like a teletune or whatever, or tune a guitar, but it's uh, it's always more of an o sound. Uh, the, like nongum is how we say today, and that's spelled with two o's at the first sound. So. Uh, uh, eh, eh, oh, oh. <laughs> and uh, that's one of the first things you learn as a kid in kindergarten um, is uh, this chart <laughs> and it's actually I've seen three different ways people have organized this I always thought it was just the one because I don't think I learned it uh, uh, eh, eh, oh, oh. I might have learned yeah I learned uh, eh, oh, uh, eh, oh, eh. and so then you go all the way down the chart 
Um, so you've got the vowels at the top and the consonants on the left. Uh, so you got b, d, g, j, z. And uh, z, h is a z sound, like bonjour or measure. Um, that's not a sound typically written that way in English. So that's one that might not appear to most people. Uh, p, t, k, pretty straightforward. I'm just trying to think if there's examples that you see that you wouldn't hear in English. Um, but I would think the bigger ones are like the z sound and the, the g as in g is always a g hard g. It's not like garage that z garage that would be written with a zh. Um, and also it it uh, can throw people the way things are written. Um, the one I always think about is in Kerb Lake. If you didn't hear somebody, you'll say why. Uh, the way that would be written in this system would be spelled the same way we spell the wrong way. It'd be w a y. That is how you would spell that. But I don't think enough people know this system well enough to realize that. Um, and even folks who do speak the language, uh, they might not have grown up with this. Obviously, uh, my papa uh, spoke the language most of his life, but he is not familiar that much with writing it. So this wouldn't seem intuitive to him. Whereas for me, I've known this since I was five years old, so it just makes sense. Um, and that's typically what you find. And my granny was generally familiar with this because she taught it. Um, at schools and she learned it at uh, university to teach Nishinaabem. Um, there are some sounds in here, some clusters of vowels and uh, consonants that don't come up too often, um, but this is uh, the pretty much the extent of what can appear. Uh, i also mention that Nishinaabem, um, kind of like a number of uh, like Japanese or uh, Asian languages, I believe, at least Japanese, will typically have these vowel consonant clusters like this. It always appears like that. It's not often like in English, I'm trying to think of an example, where you have a number of consonants together, um, like slept, like how you have the PT at the end of it. it uh, if you think of any Japanese uh, company name, uh, like Toyota, Mitsubishi, uh, you know, Toshiba, it's always uh, a syllable like a matter of syllables matching up. Um, so that's, um, sorry, so that's the primary system of writing that is used in most academic settings and most study of the language. Um, but there are some other ones that you'll encounter too. So if you see on the left here, uh, the, on the right is an example of what that um, writing looks like. Uh, it's not, this isn't a, a copy of each, it's just a comparison. Although the very first two words up there, me is uh, the exact same that's written over here. So this is an old thing. I don't know how old this writing is. I think it was from the 30s, if not the 1800s at some point, but they've written a completely different style. And um, that's the reason that academics move towards this, uh, this double vowel system, because it's very consistent. It's always the same, um, because there's all these other systems that got used previous to that. Um, and then this is another one. That's a bit closer, so that um, the writing on the left is from Basil Johnson, who was a, a very prominent um, Nishinaabe author. And uh, his system, so he actually really didn't like the double vowel system. Um, he grew up, uh, you know, w learning typical English Roman spelling, and he created his own little system here. And it's not too bad. Um, I don't think there's too much that I can complain about with it, to be honest with you. But uh, it, it, to me, appears to be longer, typically the way he writes it. And there's a couple of things I think I've seen once or twice that were not quite as consistent for me. And I think just by comparison, I grew up with stuff on the right, so I don't really like stuff on the left. And he grew up with stuff on the left, so he didn't really like stuff on the right. Um, but he's got a lot of great knowledge. Uh, unfortunately, he passed away a few years ago, but um, he has a lot of good stuff out there. Um, the other uh, writing system that's used for Nishinaabemwin, which kind of has a cool tie for us in the local area here, and uh, specifically with the church, actually, is uh, syllabics. So uh, <clears throat> syllabics, uh, there's, well, there's two origins of the story. The one actually is that um, it was uh, brought to the Cree people by a man named uh, Waking or Walking Badger, Waking Badger, I can't remember. I forgot how to say his name in Cree. It's not too bad, but at any rate, uh, he had a near death experience and uh, had a dream about these letters and uh, um, how to write down their language and shared it with them. Um, so there's that version of the story, um, and then the written version of the story is about this man named uh, James Evans, who was a missionary, and uh, this was back in the 1830s and 1840s, and apparently he came to uh, Rice Lake area, actually, so Hiawatha, just south of Peterborough, 
and he learned how to speak and, and uh, converse in Anishinaabe and in Ojibwe. And he wanted to convert the community there, the people there, and uh, teach them the Bible, um, but in their language, whereas most other missionaries were just trying to do it in English. And I think he kind of did face a bit of adversary there from within the church around, like, we'll just teach them English, don't bother with their language, and we kind of want them to stop all that altogether. Um, but he really tried to persevere and do this, and, and so he was writing using um, something like the stuff on the left, or it might have been a bit of this. I think he actually put hyphens between every sound, um, but it ended up just not working very well, apparently. Um, at any rate, in the 1840s or so, he moved up to Norway House in Manitoba, where they're Cree, and he learned their language. And uh, apparently he had some knowledge of these this script used in a region of India. I can't remember the specific names at this time. But um, in that area, every symbol represents a syllable. So it's uh, that's why it's called the syllabic system. So you can see the chart here mixes on the left a consonant with a vowel on the right. And so uh, as opposed to 26 letters we have in the Roman alphabet, there's pretty much, I think it's just 10 here, uh, something like that. And depending on which way the symbol is turned, you're gonna have a different uh, vowel attached to that consonant. Um, so <clears throat> it's actually really quick to learn. It only takes a couple hours to learn how to read it versus like, I don't know how many hundreds or dozens at least hours to learn how to read uh, Roman alphabet. Um, so it's very consistent, very straightforward. And uh, it was so easy that the Cree in the 1840s or so, um, after learning it from Norway House initially, they went and spread it on to communities beyond that region. When James Evans left Norway House to go to other communities to preach and stuff, he found that they were already using the system that he, he helped with. And uh, well, and that's part of it too, actually, is that there's some communication around, even if James Evans really had a leading part in doing this, he still had to work with Indigenous people. So it's just there's a conversation around not making the focus just around like this one guy right and uh anyway and uh, a non-indigenous person in particular but um it was so easy though that the cree back at that time had a higher literacy rate than the english and french speakers in canada apparently which is uh, quite uh, significant and, and quite impressive so this um, then kind of backtracked on Anishinaabemwin as well. So in Northern Ojibwe, there were some communities that uh, used this system. I don't think it's quite as prevalent anymore, um, but also it got carried up to the Inuit who uh, I guess some of their folks came down to Moose Factory, Ontario, where they're at Cree, and they saw them using the system and uh, adapted it to their own language. And that's why most people typically associate this with Inuit, I believe, like Inuit uh, people's language, Inuktitut, but it actually started with the Cree. So, um, and then just for reference, <clears throat> uh, at the top there are triangles. So if there's no consonant attached to it, like Anishinaabe, the word Anishinaabe starts with an A. It would have a triangle at the start because it doesn't have a vowel or a consonant attached to it. And then if there's a, a consonant at the end of a word, it has one of those finals on the right. So I can explain this whole system to you uh, in depth, but we'll leave it at that because it, it could take a little while. Oh, I will mention though, at the bottom you can see. Um, part of the reason there are so few letters uh, or symbols is that B's and P's are joined together because they're both plosive um, consonants. They're both used kind of puffing off of your lips. Uh, G's and K's, uh, I believe it's called guttural, I can't remember, guttural or bottle. Uh, they both come from the back of your throat, G and K. And the difference between these two sounds is one is voiced, one has a bit more air breathing through it. Um, D's and T's likewise are dentals. Or, kind of kicked off your tongue, or your teeth, sorry, um, and ch and j, ch, ch and j are the same, and s and z are the same, and sh and j are the same. So be aware of that. <laughs> um, just an example of how that looks as well. So it one thing that's really nice about it is it really shortens down the written language. So Anishinaabem, when you can see there, has quite a number of uh, letters. And uh, if you're wondering, that is the Ojibwe language as a word, as a noun. Um, but that's how it's written in syllabics just above it, and then spaced out beneath it. And that's an example. It's really cool to, to look into if you ever wanted to check it out, but uh, it helps to have a bit of background in the language, obviously. <clears throat> and then this is like a full one. DJ, oh. can I just interrupt you for a second? Um, yep. So we're going to try to have some time for question and answer, and also... Sure. Yeah, I guess we're... Minutes. I was trying to keep track of time, but... Yeah, so if you could take five minutes to wrap up or... 
or less? Sure. Yeah, I, I was actually right near the end anyway, I think. So, um, yeah, I'll just really quickly just mention the dialects here and then uh, I'll uh, open up the floor. So, does that sound all right or, or what do you think? Yeah, yeah, no, that sounds good. Yeah, so um, just a quick uh, map here, though, of the dialects. So, the blue area down by Toronto, that's the Mississauga National Bag, that's us here. Um, we're actually named after a great river outlet, and that's what Mississauga means. And it's the same origin as uh, Mississippi. Mississippi means a uh, great river. So, uh, And then the Odawa, uh, right next to us, are the other very prominent uh, group around here. Anyway, I'll leave that for now. Um, but one thing I just want to point out for folks that may encounter this, um, this is one that might confuse people a lot. Uh, in southern Ontario, especially, like from Sudbury south, uh, you, you're more likely to encounter a Nishinaabe uh, without the uh in front of it. And that's because we have a syncopated dialect that's shortened down. So we don't say the uh in a Nishinaabe, um, but it is the same word. So just be aware of that if you ever see it, not to get too confusing. Likewise, Ojibwe itself is relatively synonymous, but Anishinaabe is our own word for ourselves. Ojibwe has some uh, different origins. We aren't quite sure 100%. Um, and then just some comparison there of how you'll see it up north and down south. And even between communities, you'll find specific things. I've seen some funny stuff in Curve Lake that you don't see in other places and vice versa. So, but uh, anyway, uh, there are a lot of uh, resources out there if anybody wants to see some of the links. Some of these, I've found the bottom, second bottom link there doesn't work anymore, unfortunately. Uh, but uh, if you ever want to see any of the um, various websites out there, there's tons of them, I can uh, send along some of these links to folks if they want. And this this is the particular page I don't think works anymore. I haven't found it again. So. And then uh, this is all the books that are out there too. There's lots of resources. So there's lots of um, materials for folks and there's a lot of language camps and things going on. So although there's some challenging elements um, facing the language, there's still a lot of uh, hope and a lot of um, ability for us to, you know, revitalize it and strengthen it and keep it alive. Yeah. Anyway, we'll uh, hide this. I don't know. It might be best actually, I guess, if I leave it on this so that uh, I'm not, uh, or if I hide my video, perhaps that's what I'll do. <clears throat> um, okay. I'll open up the floor to questions. Miigwech, so, Zindwieg, thank you for listening. Well, DJ, I'm always amazed at um, your knowledge and uh, just lots to think about. And I'm sure that, uh, you know. Neil Young, thank you. Really. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> really enlightening for a lot of people. Um, so I guess we will jump into questions. And um, I, I guess the chat function is one way to do it, or you can physically raise your hand. And I'm hoping that Shelly could maybe help me uh, moderate this part. So um, you can turn your cameras back on with the exception of DJ, because we yeah. what you have to it's say in response. We want to hear what you have to say in response, DJ. So, um, yep. Shelly, if you want to look at the first screen of folks, I could look at the second screen. Does that sound like a plan? And um, okay. So just raise raise your hand physically if you have a question, or you can use the chat function, or maybe it's something that uh, you know really um, yeah, just spoke to you was a was a learning for you in this in this talk on the bottom there's also a um the reactions button and you can put your you can make a a hand motion of that if you want or perhaps um <laughs> people could uh also chat too perhaps for sure um ruth over here has a question yes um thank you very much it was fabulous and all kinds of insights that I hadn't even thought of. The, the worldview was the land and the language and everything is amazing. But um, are, for children living on reserve, but reserve schools, are they taught in their language for the first few years at all or any of the schools? So um, around here uh, we have, it's an Ojibwe class. It would be like having French class. And it's available, and it was to me, from kindergarten up. Um, but there are some places in Nishinaabek country, like I'm thinking of Tulin Island and in Minnesota, 
where they've actually started immersion schools. Um, and I, I think most of those are at least up to grade three. There might be one up to grade six. I, I don't know. My mom might actually know. I can't think uh, what the highest grade is right now. But out in Minnesota, they've got a really good immersion school. And there's one as well in Michigan and uh, Manitoulin. So there, there's places like that. But most of the time, it's just a, a separate, like it's just a class, like a course, rather than the whole school experience, I guess. So, yeah. so it has been a challenge having enough language teachers actually to teach the language. And uh, like DJ was saying, it, it is still taught like as, as a second language in many schools. And um, there's been community buy-in issues and all kinds of issues to, to go full-blown immersion. But uh, there have been a couple of successful schools, but it really is just a small handful. And um, uh, similarly as French immersion, itself even doesn't even produce French speakers most often. Um, we still haven't got to where there are immersion programs producing full speakers. So, but there's a, there's a pocket like DJ, a pocket of, of young people who are persevering. They're really doing whatever it takes to learn the language. And it, it's quite a beautiful thing, actually. There's, a, there's even a bunch of characteristics that are, there's a, uh, just happens that these, this group of people are emerging. And um, so it's quite exciting in that regard. Right. I know there's, there's many families of people, of, of immigrants, who, who the grandparents or the great grandparents spoke the language, but it's not passed on to the children or it's not used in the home or when they came to Canada, it wasn't a priority for them retaining the language of their ancestors, right? Or continuing to use the language. So, and I've met many, many people who have have told me, or I know that their grandparents spoke a language they do not know. And they knew their grandparents, yeah. but yet they, they didn't, yeah, it wasn't a priority somehow. It was not something in it. So, I mean, I, I wish I had a, another language um, that yeah. could have been passed to me as part of the cultural from my gr grandparents that I knew and spent time with. But it's such a valuable um, uh, part of your culture and, and ancestry. But there's a the difference. The difference, the difference, though, is that, Meg, you could yeah. easily go back to where that language is spoken today. That's true. I heard, and, yeah, but I here, heard. Yes. where the people have been here forever, yeah. That language, it's a struggle to keep that language alive. So there is a difference. So there is a big difference. Yeah. So, so I actually, I, I worked for a few years as, a, as an occasional teacher in Toronto. And I worked next to the First Nations school in Toronto for a year. I worked at the Dundas Street uh, school and there was a First Nations school. I did not know Toronto had a First Nations school and I, I really didn't learn much about it because I had to do my own class and in that part of the school. Is that, does anyone know, is that a, a place where there, there is an opportunity to learn language where uh, people who are in the area, of course, could register their children um, for languages, First Nation uh, language study? Anyone it know? Is, it is a Toronto District School Board school the First Nation school, and they do have some language there, but again, um, it's not an immersion program, and, and it is spoken as a second language. It was taught as a second language still. So um, again, you have the, the challenges of speakers who are teachers. Well, we need, we need uh, more people like uh, DJ. Mm. <laughs> Yeah, um, so actually um, to continue on that thought too of, uh, uh, you know, the lack of, not necessarily lack of priority, but, or, but um, something I do mention sometimes in talks like this is around uh, one of the other ways that the language can kind of get lost. It's just that, uh, I guess, I don't know if it's just being like younger folks not having or finding the prestige in their, their um, you know, traditional language, I guess. Um, but, you know, folks don't necessarily recognize that uh, at the time. So like my mom's parents, 
you know, wouldn't have been thinking when they're raising their kids, like, oh, we have to really make sure to, to teach them this specifically. Like, it, it, w- that it wasn't a priority that way. It wasn't prestige. I've heard or read somewhere that in the U.S., if it wasn't for a continual immigration of Spanish-speaking people in uh, the U.S., Spanish would cease to be spoken in two generations because it doesn't have prestige for most people. Um, what's going to get you jobs and what's going to get you further in the world is English, the, the maiden language, right? So. Yeah. In our, our case, it was, um, it was a, a, a mandate. It was a mandate to ensure that the language wasn't, was lost. So um, it was literally scared into the parents to not teach their kids because of how the parents were, were treated in school for speaking the language. So my parents distinctly told me, you know, when I asked why you're teaching me how to speak like you, and they said, because we don't want you t- treated the way we were treated in school for speaking the language. So there, there's a mandate here to make sure the language was on its way out. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I think I saw uh, Helmut uh, had a question. Yeah. Oh, Janet? Yeah, Janet. Um, yeah, when you were showing all the different ways of writing the language, I was thinking about all the great uh, Indigenous authors that we have that are writing in English. And I wondered if there's anybody writing in the native languages or if any of those great books, are award-winning books, are being translated into Indigenous languages and printed. But, you know, I sort of figure, would it, would it be even appropriate or... And of course, it probably wouldn't be economically viable because there wouldn't be enough shoppers. Um, yeah, um, actually, there are some. Um, so actually, there's there's a there's some that are you know fully Nishnab and when those are very uh, rare. Uh, and I believe there are a couple of books that are translated. I have this one book um, that was actually a book of poems by a Nishnab uh, poet from way up north in Laxul, and uh, it was translated or short stories or poems either way and it was translated by another member of the community up there um, Patricia Nicholas. and uh, there's another book too that uh, is more recent and so I think the way that they can kind of bridge the gap uh, as far as you know making it available to the wider audience it is mostly in English but there are some Nishnaba um, segments and they're actually quite interesting the one in particular um, that I'm speaking about is Sounding Thunder. It's about uh, Francis Pegamagabo, um, the World War One sniper from uh, Perry Island, from Wasoxing First Nation. And it's really cool. It's a really good little book. His, uh, I don't know if it's his uh, great nephew or his great grandson um, wrote it, but it's a really cool book. So, yeah. <clears throat> so there are some out there. Yeah, and actually, great. These are a bunch. This is a set of Robert Mike books that have been uh, translated. So uh, there's more the whole set that um, so we do have quite a few children's books actually. Mm-hmm. Uh, a comment in the chat that talked about you know the the role of residential schools. So when I think about that, my, I served the Hiltzuk, uh First Nation. Yeah, Shelley's just saying played a huge part. So I had um, you know members of my church say you know when we were speaking class language at residential school we had pins put through our tongue um so the church we we, we look at uh, truth and reconciliation um this is almost i think a step beyond that knowledge like we we're aware of that and and um i think one of the questions that i ask as an ally is what what can i do to you know to to make space or to 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 try to help in that big challenge of, of reclaiming the language and it's just amazing um you know dj what he's doing and we're hoping next week to not next week next month to have uh, and maybe this is a time uh sharon could you screen share that poster of our second part of the series um and ann taylor is um is another member at Curve Lake and uh, tasked with uh, yeah, supporting language revitalization. Um, so um, you're the first to see this poster. Um, thanks, Helmut, for making it. Uh, and it's going to be March the 2nd, again, similar format. And uh, DJ, can you, can you see? Uh, I wonder if you could read that for us. Oh, sure, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, Mang Kwan. Ndijnikaz miu de nado no swin. 
Uh, and uh, so she says, my name is Lynn Feather. That is my spirit name. And Taylor and Dejagnosh Noswin. Uh, and Taylor, my oh, so she's kind of going back and forth. Uh, and Taylor, my English name, Nagig Ganin Dodem, I'm of the Otter Clan, and Shkigmong Ganin Donjaba. I am also from Curve Lake. I'm Chisagi Ganishna Bekwando. I'm a Mishisagi Ganishna woman, sorry. And I was raised by my mom, my granny, and uh, my papa. So she doesn't have any more Nishna Bekwando here, obviously. Uh, my granny taught me to be proud of my heritage and taught me how to be. How important Anishinaabe one is, and uh, my papa taught me about uh, connecting with the land and the water, and all those who dwell there. Uh, yeah, and actually, I just wanted to make a quick note too. Uh, it's another case of language being specific to uh, family or community. I think papa is a very curved lake way of calling out a grandfather. Actually, you'll find that quite a bit. So, but yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. So anyway, um. D DJ shared uh, kind of his relationship with the language and, and Anne will be, you know, sharing her relationship with the language. And then we, uh, we hope that we'll, we'll be able to visit um, Haudenosaunee communities so that uh, Iroquoian language group, uh, Mohawk language uh, at Tyndanaga, uh, and possibly even check out uh, a language nest in Kingston. So we're hoping to do uh, one a month of these, of these sessions and that, uh, uh, you know, I think we're just off to a to a great start tonight. And uh, again, a lot of people have expressed their th their thanks to DJ um, Aruna. I don't know if if you'd like to share some words at this time. Oh, you're still muted there, Aruna. You'll have to unmute yourself. There you go. Okay, done. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, for me, this was a, an introduction. And so what I found really interesting was uh, a sense of the anatomy uh, of the language and, um, and some of the structure uh, in terms of um, lived uh, experience and connecting that to the uh, reconciliation um, vision I think it's really important for us as Canadian citizens to um, try to learn at least some of the uh, greeting uh, phrases with the um, First Nations people in our communities and so that we can have just sort of begin with general greeting conversation and that kind of thing, a few words. Uh, uh, a few phrases, a few sentences. And so that's a different, um, uh, that's a different reality from the indigenous communities themselves, um, keeping their language alive. But the other side of the coin is that for us as Canadian citizens to keep the language of the um, First Nations alive as well and so um, just uh, an easy way of beginning is to is to just learn some you know phrases sentences words of greeting that sort of thing like we... so that's what i would have to say and, and thank you very much dj miigwech um, and thanks for the uh, opportunity too i really appreciate it Is there anything else? Or, um, yeah, but uh, yeah, I, I, uh, I'm always <laughs> pushing time. <laughs> I, uh, there's other things I could definitely get to. I, I can just talk and talk and talk. That's what I do. But um, I'm glad I was able to share what I could with everybody. Um, and uh, and uh, I was just thinking about uh, Rodney's question, too, about thinking about what, uh, you know, we can do as allies to help language and all that. And and I, I think what I try to do with, with talks like these is just to just to crack a little little bit of, on some of the history that is within the language and some of the knowledge that's there to, to really show people why it's uh, it's important and why it's um, a valuable thing to keep around the language. And so I don't I don't know to the specifics about what to tell you, you know, go do this and that's how it'll support the language, but it'll make you more open to those opportunities. And if you see something that you're like, well, this could help out people with language or 
or maybe if you know you see a historical place or you see a place name um maybe you can look into it and you can teach other people you know your children or someone you know about that history and say you know this is probably a Anishinaab word um a great example too is just around the corner here we've uh, got a, a road named uh it's Kakabika is how it's spelled and there's also Kakabika Provincial Parkway up north it should be pronounced Gagavaka, but that, it doesn't mean waterfalls, but it's kind of about stepped falls. I asked my granny once about that. But it, it's a little example like that. You see signs on the road and stuff. It's it's there. The history is there. You just got to keep your eye out for it. So, yeah. Anyway, I'll uh, leave it at that. <laughs> so um, I know Ann Taylor, uh, part of her feeling, and I've heard her articulate it, is, you know, her, her effort is, is really around uh, supporting Indigenous people in learning language. Um, now, having said that, she said, I'm always glad to talk to audiences about the language. Like you, DJ, she's passionate uh, about the language. But there was a question that came up uh, you know, for non-Indigenous people to, to learn the language and those those phrases, words like uh, and pretty soon we're gonna be saying gawabman, goodbye. Is there a place that you could turn us to, uh, DJ? Uh, maybe online resources or uh, I know some people actually who registered tonight are involved in classes in their communities. There, there are uh, opportunities like that, but online that any of us could could learn some basic Ojibwe words. Uh, yeah, well, um, so I like I said, I was going to do a little one typed up there, but um, if you're not familiar, Anin is uh, one of the, the key words to know. Um, it literally means how it's kind of it's it's very informal. It, it's short for how are you doing, but that's how everybody greets each other generally if you know someone. Um, you might also hear bojo, um, however, and uh, I can type these out if folks want to see them in the chat there, but anin um, is also used in a number of questions as well, so that's why it's a little different. I don't know if that's where the stereotype of the native guy going how comes from, but um, that's the typical greeting is anin, and bojo is the formal greeting and that shortened down from uh, when a bojo, the, the trickster. And there's a whole story there as to why you greet people as bojo. Um, and then typically the typical greeting is your name. So for example, I would say DJ, you just replace DJ with your name. Nidijnikaz. Oops. And uh, DJ Nidijnikaz, and that's, uh, I'm called DJ, effectively. And then likewise, uh, Curve Lake, Donjaba. I'm from Curve Lake. That's actually like the very basic greeting that like any language learners taught typically is Anin, DJ Indigenous, Curve Lake, Donjaba. And then if you have a clan, um, you know, from Dodam, is uh, so like Migazi was Eagle, Migazi in Dodam, uh, Eagle is my clan. Um, this is another thing too, is uh, as far as grammar goes, the order. Typically, you see is like that. You'll say Curve Lake and Donjaba, like Curve Lake I am from, but it's not as written in stone as it is in English. So you could say Donjaba Curve Lake if, if you're not going to be frowned upon or anything like that. So, um, trying to think if there's other. Oh, and then uh, as we have kind of alluded to there as well, Guabman is a uh, see ya. <laughs> um, and it literally means that. So I don't like I, I can I, like I said, I can just keep talking and talking. <laughs> The thing about Anishinaabeg culture and, and a lot of Indigenous cultures is that it, it wasn't necessarily as formalized or as formal as uh, many uh, European languages. So there are no formalities like please uh, or you're welcome. Um, the closest thing to please is Dagana, and that just means come on, <laughs> like hand me that, come on. Um, and I think actually I've read of a bit of a uh, disconnect there with with early Europeans and indigenous peoples they're like why are these people so rude like they just like give me that and and take this and this and that and and the these people were kind of like why are they so pleading they're always like please they're trying to borrow their words and things and it's just the culture the language is very tied to the culture right so there's gonna be some differences because uh, a lot of people I find when they're looking to learn the language they ask for those formalities they're like how do I say please and thank you and you're welcome and uh, miigwech is how we say thank, thank you today. I have some theories that it might be a newer word, but I don't know that I wasn't there to see it happen when it came to be, but um, miigwech is about as close to, to formalities as we see. Thank you, miigwech. So. Uh, oh, sorry. What the heck is going on here? What 
Is he going? Oh, Rodney, you're uh, muted, I think. Yeah, he's. Uh, I muted. sure am. I sure am. Is that why you had your hand up, Arena? <laughs> yeah. I oh, no. Okay. Well, no, 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 no. I, 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 I just thought it was wonderful because there's a very young lady sitting with Jessica, and and it would be lovely to know her name and um, just just to acknowledge her presence with us. It's wonderful to have her with here. Thank you. Uh, and uh, miigwech, this is Jillian. And Jillian's in grade eight. Uh, we live in Ottawa. And uh, we are very glad to be here tonight and learn the, the very basics of all this. This is so interesting. So miigwech, thank you, uh, DJ, for, for um, your knowledge and your wonderful stories and all of that kind of stuff. It's just been uh, a joy to listen to you. So thank you, miigwech. And is Julia learning a uh, language? No. Well, learning French, aren't you? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> oh, okay. Learning French, but um, but that was one of the things we were kind of wondering about is is learning um, greetings and things like that. Um, so DJ, if if uh, you were able to send some information out that we could um, learn, and I so I'm a I'm a minister of children, youth, and families at Trinity United in Ottawa. And I have a youth group that was going to come to Curve Lake <laughs> last June, but of course, we weren't able to do that. Um, so we were, were hoping to kind of uh, rebook that trip, and uh, it would be great to have some some more of the knowledge and the language that we could use while we're there. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Um, a, a lot of this stuff is the very least you'll need to get by. The Anin, Toronto, and Dijnakaz, Ottawa, and Donjava. Uh, and you don't have to give a clan, obviously, or calling to get candy and Dodem. I don't know what my clan is. Um, but, uh, yeah, I can uh, whip up some stuff and send it along, and we can kind of disperse that out. Um, there's also, I, I can probably link a few web pages as well where you can find all sorts of stuff like that, um, which is great. And for uh, um, your daughter there, I will mention that actually one of the students I have in my class um, took French, and it was quite proficient in French before she wanted to try out a Ojibwe too. So one thing for that is, uh, as I understand it, once you've learned a second language, learning other languages is easier because you kind of have a system figured out. Uh, one thing is it, it's not a European language, so there's gonna be some drastic differences, I guess, but at least you have some experience working through that mess of, of you know, knowing two languages. So that's always good to learn something, right? Yeah. yeah. So we're, now we're on Algonquin territory. So is that, is, is it, quite a similar type of greeting? Uh, yeah, so actually with them, um, so like I was saying, I would consider them to be a dialect of Anishinaabemwin, but one thing you'll find with them is instead of saying anin or bojo as a greeting, they'll say uh, uh, kwe kwe. I think they might even say that for a goodbye, I don't know. I don't know how, I think that's how they pronounce it, kwe kwe, but most of the other stuff there you will see is said the same way. They might spell it a little differently um, like I said, different places, they, they write things a little differently, but uh, I've seen a lot of their language and, and uh, I can understand it generally. So, yeah. Awesome. Well, thank you very much. No problem. Thanks. Okay. Well, um, I think we better wrap it up here now. We're, we're seven minutes past. Our... <laughs> okay. I'm glad you're so eager. Uh, yeah. Put your hand up first. Make. Oh, I, I, I just wanted to mention, when I was in Toronto, I was very fortunate to be able to go to the Anishinaabe Center. And I took courses that were available to me, and I, I took workshops and, and learned a great deal, not nearly as much as I need to know, about the residential schools, about um, treaties and all of this. And the language, there was some... Um, effort to introduce language to us. But whatever I learned, I forgot because I didn't use it. And I wasn't able to um, go, like like we were saying, go to a class or somewhere more formally where I could learn um, more of the language and have it stick or have a resource where I'm using it though with someone because it's hard to learn a language without speaking it and all of that. So, I mean, I'd be interested in taking a class if there was one in the vicinity, but I don't, I, or online. Well, we, we will certainly share some, uh, some resources. Uh, 
with folks. Uh, Ojibwe.net, Shelly pointed out, and uh, thanks. So just thanks again, miigwech, everybody. And mm -hmm. uh, go on, <laughs> <men>. <laughs> We'll I hope to see you in a month's time.